In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God the Father has his ear turned toward you. God the Son pleads to you before the kingdom throne. Lord, teach us to pray. God the Holy Spirit gives you the words when you don't know what to say. Lord, teach us to pray. God is always attentive, always listening, always ready, willing and able to help in time of need. He loves to be your God and your shield. Lord, teach us to pray. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Lord, teach us to pray. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. 
There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him an action to weigh. The bowls of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hardened themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ashy. And to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillar of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a person prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And a reading from the fifth chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. We ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very happily in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, those who can, without difficulty, please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words, for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. O Christ. You may be seated. A couple of announcements quickly. For uh, most of you have been relevant 
Yet last night was the funeral for Donna Peer. However, if you were not able to make it and you want to uh, be able to give your respects to the condolences to the family, two o'clock Friday we will have the internment of our ashes at Fernicliff. So it is open to everyone. It's not private for the family. Um, but anyone may come. We'll meet at the gate at Fernicliff at two o'clock and then drive to the grave after the internment service is over. We will gather back here in the fellowship hall for a light meal. So that will be this coming Friday at 2 o'clock. Also, next week, our topic will be Do Not Worry, something all of us do. So we will hear Jesus talking about for us not to worry. Matthew 6, 25 to 34 will be the text. So do not worry. Let us now sing what our friend we have in Jesus.
of these instructions have it in for us. More than once, I have disassembled something and had to try a second time to assemble it correctly, all the while feeling that there was a conspiracy about to make my life miserable. More than once, I have thought, why can't the instructions first tell me what not to do and then tell me what to do? I remember especially when our boys were younger and they'd see these toys advertised on TV and they, they would want them and you'd, you'd buy them and then they'd open them up on Christmas and they'd pull them out of the box and they weren't put together like they were in the advertisement. You had to sit there and put them together. Uh, and when they, they went through a phase where they were big in the G.I. Joe, and you know, G.I. Joe came out with all these planes and tanks and jeeps and all this. You take them out of the box, and you had to put every one of those decals on them. You had to put the wings together. You had to put the treads on the tanks and the turn on the tank. And it was like, why couldn't you just have wanted a Tonka toy? Because those, when you pull them out of the box, they're ready to play with. You know, there's no decal added. Nothing to put together, they're ready to be that bulldozer or ditch digger or rocket, road grader or dump truck or whatever. There's always a right way and a wrong way. This is essentially what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount with the great three pillars of Jews giving to the poor, prayer, and fast. Clearly, these three spiritual disciplines are core practices still today in our Christian faith. Jesus wants us to know how we can do it wrong and how we can do it right. Just before our gospel reading for this evening, verses 5 through 16, the first four verses, Jesus is pointing out to us on giving out to give to the poor. He makes it clear on how to give and on how not to give. How not to give is to make a big show of one's giving, doing it publicly with a lot of fanfare so as to be seen. It reminds us of those Hollywood celebrities. When we see on the news that some higher couple in Hollywood put on this big fundraiser for the homeless, or back in the 90s, it was a thing that put on a big fundraiser for AIDS, research and AIDS. And then after it's all over, we find out later on that the couple who got all the praise and all the glory and so forth actually donated very little to the cause for which they were having that fundraiser. And that's what's often the case when people give something they want a lot of fanfare and so forth. Jesus is saying, that's not what we do. You know, this kind of attitude is like someone sitting in a pew who makes out a very generous check for the church, which is greatly appreciated, but instead of folding it in half or putting an envelope, they lay it face up so that everyone else who sees that often play go by the road can see what a generous check they gave. And the usher, of course, can see it and stare at it all the way up to the altar to give the offering plates to the officiant or the acolyte or whoever is collecting them. Jesus says, that's not the way it goes. That's not how to give. The right way to give, though, Jesus says, is to give in private or in secret, keeping the gift between you and God alone. That has been a big debate over the years about pledging. Most churches want people to pledge. The logical reason is that by pledging, the finance committee can gain an idea about how much income 
more can come in for the next year. So they can make the budget appropriately. But some people feel like the pledge, you're doing exactly what Jesus is saying now. You're not keeping it between you and God alone. You're letting everyone else know what you're giving. And so, and I have sympathy for those people because I've wrestled with that myself. Is, is, do we pledge or do we let people just keep it between themselves and the Lord? The ones who give the wrong way, the showy public way, they already have their reward, Jesus teaches us. People have noticed them. They got just what they want. Those who get the right way, the righteous way, on the other hand, their rewards are in secret, deep within a loving, growing relationship with our Heavenly Father. This is why Jesus said in the verses we didn't read, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. The idea that we are being keeping this so secret between us and God that we forget then what we've done. Because what was important was that we were giving to God, not how much we gave to God. So the first four verses that were not part of our reading for some reason. Jesus began by saying, Beware. Now, we're aware of it. Be cautious about applying yourself to this kind of action. So be cautious about your practices, uh, uh, practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for they will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. That means they will not have literally no payment for their service. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised, that is, to be esteemed and recognized by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, that is, they obtained from um, what they wanted, they obtained from another, that is, all that praise and stuff, and they've received fully without any more coming to them. In other words, Jesus is talking about the fact that since they made this big scene, they're not going to receive any blessings from God. Because they weren't interested in blessings from God. They were interested in putting on a show. They were interested in popularity and praise. They were interested in everybody talking about them, how generous they are. So Jesus says, you don't want to do that. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That word know means uh, to be aware of or to perceive. So that your giving may be in secret, it is concealed and private, and your Father who sees in secret, who beholds or regards what right you're doing, will reward you. That means to deliver something to someone, to render something to you, to give something away. So when we are giving to the poor, we do it privately and secretly, not looking for that reward or praise or recognition. Jesus' concern here is our motivation. Where is our heart? Is our heart with our Father in heaven, or is it with ourselves? Is our heart with our Father in heaven, or is it with what others think of us? Jesus wants our giving to the poor to be deeply embedded in our relationship with God, not in our pride or need for immediate recognition. This is Something that we sometimes forget. That throughout his public ministry, the point Jesus was constantly trying to make was not obeying rituals and rules and traditions, but where is your heart? What is your motivation? Is it really a commitment and faith? 
faith in God to him? Or are you strictly looking for a show? Are you strictly looking for praise? After talking about giving to the poor, then Jesus goes on to address the other two great principles or acts of righteousness in Judaism, so revered by Judaism, and that is prayer and fasting. And when especially we Christians perk up our ears at these two topics and more readily listen to Jesus' thought on these practices, because that is a time of prayer and fasting and repentance. His comments are structured just the same way as they were about giving to the poor. How not to pray and how to pray. How not to fast and how to fast. His focus is very similar, as I said, at giving to the poor. The wrong way to put a prayer together, Jesus says, is to be sure others see and hear you praying in the synagogue or on the streets. Showmanship of you. Which brings up, for me, this constant wrestling I have, and I share this with my Sunday school class Sunday, of giving thanks in a restaurant. I always believe in giving thanks before I eat. But if I say a prayer out loud so the people around me can hear it, am I violating what Jesus says here? But on the other hand, Jesus says if we deny him before others, he will deny us before Heavenly Father. Is praying in public over your food then a way of witnessing to the rest of the restaurant that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? I remember when I was serving in Kentucky, we had a big Christmas meal and we went across the Ohio Ocean to Cincinnati to Spaghetti Factory. And I know, it was about 25 of us. And someone said, well, let's have a blessing. And we all stood around the table holding hands and one of the pastors gave a prayer. And the whole time I was uncomfortable because I saw everybody staring at us and I'm like, now are we doing this because we're truly giving thanks? Are we doing this so the people say, oh, look at all those people there who are praying? Because since it was a Christmas celebration, a Christmas dinner type thing, none of us had our collars on. We were just in suits and ties, so and they didn't know who we were except that we were Christians. So I've always wrestled with this. My preference is that when my food comes, my wife and I bow our heads and just pray something. So that way I feel like I'm witnessing to Jesus. But I'm not intruding on people and trying to get their attention so they can say, oh, look how pious he is. So he's praying for his food. Jesus does not want shutmanship. The wrong way to put a prayer together, he says, is to think that a prayer's value is in its length. And how many of us have been to someone who prayed and prayed and prayed? When I was in Griffin, we had a little town uh, pastoral group. There was the Catholic priest, the me, and the Episcopal priest, and the Methodist, and the Wesleyan, and the Church of God, and a couple of Baptists, and this one Baptist preacher basically had been the one who had organized the group before I arrived. And he insisted on praying every time before lunch. And we'd always meet in one of our churches. So the ladies of the church would put the meal. He would just go on and on and on. And by the time he was done, the cold food was hot and the hot food was cold. Jesus saying, link does not make a good prayer. The link may bring the prayer. Also, he says in the use of key phrases repeated over and over again or is also not the way of doing a prayer correctly. Praying over and over again in order to impress those around you. It reminds me of the five-year-old who was at worship. And during a quite lengthy prayer from the altar, there was a pause, and the young child 
spoke up loud enough for everybody to hear that Paul isn't he done praying yet? The right, the right way to pray in your personal walk with Jesus. What is it? Jesus tells us find a room, a private room, and there speak with your Father in heaven. Some of you may have seen the movie that came out couple of years ago called The War Room. It was about a young couple who were having, beginning to have marital problems. And the young lady, the wife, was beginning to, to fall apart and she sought solace from an older woman in the congregation. And the woman took her to her house. And she opened this door in this little bitty room. And there was a little desk a Bible on the desk, and there were all these scriptures taped or pushed in into the wall, and also some short prayers. She explained to the young wife, she said, this is my word. She says, this is where I go every day, and I pray to God, and I pour out all my concerns, and all my fears, and all the petitions I have for family, myself, my friends, the church, whatever. And she says, every time I use it, I feel closer and closer to the Lord and more and more problems seem to disappear. So the young wife went home and she made her own warm room. And every day she began to pray for her and her husband's marriage. She prayed for her church. She prayed for others. And as you can imagine, by the end of the movie, the young wife and her husband had smoothed over their differences. And we're now back in church together, praising God. They went privately. Now, if you have a private place you pray, you pray in private, pray in secret, you're not going to receive any applause from anybody. Nobody's going to nominate you for intercessor of the year. Yet, your relationship with our Heavenly Father will grow exponentially just as any relationship flourishes with deep and rich conversation. And that's the clue. Deep and rich conversation. Problem with relationships today is that too many relationships, there's no deep and rich conversation. There's a lot of conversation. Twitter's filled with conversations. Texting's filled with conversations. But send it uh, emojis over your text is not a deep and rich conversation. It may symbolize something you feel, but you actually have, actually have to talk face to face, not by some fancy technology we have. I don't care, email, Twitter, text, whatever. You have to talk face to face. Because deep and rich conversation makes a relationship great. And that is why we pray. To make that relationship with God that much stronger. Probably over the past 10 years, my wife and I have had deeper and richer conversation than we had the 30 years before. Because our relationship has become deeper and and that is the way it is with any conversation if you go into it deeply and richly. Then Jesus goes one step further with the right way to pray. He says, pray then like this. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer. This is the model prayer, which, however, in no way limits what we may take to the Lord in prayer. It doesn't teach us a limiting prayer, a limiting sense what to pray for, but rather models how to pray. Pray like this. In Lutheranism, we hold the Lord's Prayer in high esteem. In such high esteem that it is a part of every liturgy of the church. You cannot find one liturgy the Lord's Prayer is not in. Sunday liturgies, wedding liturgies, 
funeral liturgies, morning prayer, evening prayer, matins, vespers, suffrages, compline, every prayer, every liturgy, every prayer service in the Lutheran tradition says the Lord's Prayer because we think that highly. Martin Luther in the small catechism, if you have the complete edition where he has about duties and about praying, he says in the morning when you get up and make the sign of the cross to recall your baptism, he gives you a morning prayer to say, and then he says, you can conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Same thing in the evening, before you go to bed, make the sign of the cross to remember your baptism. He has this evening prayer that he wrote, uh, which again you can say or make of your own, and then you conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Because it is that important to us. I always feel empty when I go to a worship service and they don't use the Lord's Prayer. And then I feel like something in the worship just had been wrong. As Jesus prays with us, as he is doing when we pray, we hear how he places our prayer into our relationship with our Father in heaven. We are praying with others when we pray the Lord's Prayer. As all the pronouns in the prayer are plural, none of them are singular. We don't pray to a distant, unfamiliar God, but to a listening, loving, protecting, providing Father who has all authority in heaven, yet who is close at hand. In the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer, it's our humility before God's name is revealed. In the first three petitions, our humility, as we say, how would be that name? Our humility is revealed for God's kingdom as we pray in thy kingdom come. In the Lord's Prayer, we show our humility in God's will. As we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The model prayer Jesus gives us has no lengthy run-on sentences, no newsy background, which our Father already knows, but terse and simple request. Then the petitions cover needs. We pray for our food. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for strength and temptation. And we pray for deliverance from evil. And Jesus does much the same with the practice of fasting. Again, in our tradition, it has always been a tradition to give something up for Lent. Now, fasting can mean giving up just a certain thing. Absolute fasting is to not eat for a couple of days, just drinking water to keep yourself from being a hydrate. That's severe fasting. Uh, other fasting is you eat something very light for breakfast and lunch and then have supper. Uh, another form of fasting is to not eat anything solid. During the day, uh, so many days, however many days you're going to fast, have to just eat like soup or stuff you put in a blender and turn into a smoothie or whatever. But it also can be just giving up something. But we're doing it in order. The idea is not to say we gave up something for Lent, but in order to focus on our spiritual relationship with God. One year for Lent, I gave up candy bars. All candy bars. So I was at a meeting, and we broke for lunch, so I went to one of the downtown, this one in spring, but we were in Troy or Sydney or West Mill or someplace to the west. So I went to one of the downtown restaurants, and the server and I got talking, and we got talking about Lent, and I told her I'd give up candy bars. So after the meal was over, I pulled a pocket out of a pocket of package of M&M's, peanuts. She said, I thought you gave up candy bars for Christmas. I mean, for Lent. I said, I did give up candy bars. She said, well, what about those m and I said, wait a minute. I said, candy bars are rectangular. 
you know, they're long and flat like Persian's almond candy bar, or they're, I guess they're still rectangle and fat like Snickers bars and Milky Ways and then, uh, Three Musketeers, Almond Joy, and that kind of thing. She goes, no, 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 you get a web camera, you can't be anything child. I said, I bet you I can. I said, she says, wait a minute, let me go talk to the other service and find out. So she went and talked to the other service. And what really surprised me was that all these servers knew about them and they had all given up some for them. So that restaurant got in, you know, 100% my eyes and they had all these Christians that knew about them and given up some. She came back and she said, you know, every one of my fellow servers agrees with you. You gave up candy bars, not giving them peanuts. But we had done this, if you grew up in a Lutheran church, yeah, you did it from the time you were three or four years old. You would get something up. Well, the wrong way to fast is to put on a miserable face in public to show how difficult your fast is and how pious you are. The right way to fast, as the right way to give and to pray, is to do so privately. Along the way of fasting, Jesus again promises great rewards as we give up the material to focus on the spiritual. Those rewards are rooted deep in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus practiced prayer and fasting in his time on earth. He had his favorite secret, secret prayer, places to pray. One was the Garden of his Son. There, in blood and sweat, he took the third petition of the Lord's Prayer to its deepest level possible. When he prayed, quote, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In the world. His prayer and fasting took him to the his Father's will and to the cross. To the cross for us. To save us from sin, death, and the power of the devil and to enable us to have this relationship with God where we feel so close to God we feel like we can converse with God at any time and through that conversing with God making that relationship strong. Now once again, as usual, some politician made a statement that totally misconstrues the Christian faith. It was after the massacre in New Zealand and those two mosques where a bunch of people were killed. And they made some statement about, well, everybody's praying and, and thinking about that, what went on, so but the prayers what could, was it to pray with the massacre happened. Her attitude is that prayer, you pray in order to have results. That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is for strengthening our relationship with God the Father. Jesus said, Father, who will take this cup from me? Not my will, thine be done. The results he would have liked, the cup being removed, didn't happen. But because he gave into his Father's will, his relationship was even stronger. And that is the purpose of our prayer. Our prayer and our fasting is meant to do the same thing it did for Jesus, and that is to bring us to the cross. To cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. To realize that is the act of salvation for the entire world. That there is nothing we can do but trust and cling to that cross and the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. There is often a wrong way and a right way to put things together. So it is with giving and prayer and fast. Jesus shows us how to do a right. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
ask that you turn to your bulletin to the prayers. Now, by those who can do so without difficulty, please. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have given us the gift of prayer and have taught us to pray. Daily remind us that you are our Father and we are your dear children. Make our lives a reflection of your great name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. O oh Lord, you have built your kingdom on the witness, testimony, and prayers of your people throughout the ages. Bring your kingdom to us and through us, that your will would be done right here and right now, just like it always is in heaven. Your kingdom, kingdom come, your, your will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. O oh Lord, you provide for all our needs of body, soul, and spirit. You never leave us or forsake us. Give us good government and earthly peace so that your gospel would be proclaimed around the world. Please bring the daily bread of your healing to all in our lives who need it. Give, Give us, us our this daily, day our daily, daily bread. O oh Lord, we are perfect sinners in need of a perfect Savior. You have provided for us all that we need for life and salvation. Make our lives an offering to you. And, and forgive, forgive us our debts as we also have, have forgiven our debtors. O oh Lord, you overcome every temptation and live the perfect life. In our baptism, you robe us in your righteousness. Free us from our sin and deliver us in the hour of every trial. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation, but, but deliver, deliver us from evil. Into your hands, Lord Jesus, we place all our needs, knowing that you are ever praying and pleading for us before the heavenly throne. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace who hears the plea of Jesus on our behalf, Bless us with prayers that are answered according to his will and for our good. Rejoice and be glad in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We close with come my soul with every care.
Thanks be to God. That concludes our Wednesday midweek Lenten service. Join us, join us on Sunday at 8 o'clock or 10.30 service. Again, St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508.